everyone and welcome to Swingers Weeks and in this video I'm going to be covering emergency hormonal contraceptives or EHC contraceptives and the consultation that goes with that. So it can be a very sensitive topic and so it does require a lot of respect and a lot of time to the patient, especially if this is the first time that the lady is asking for the morning after pill. She may not realise that she needs a consultation with the pharmacist before proceeding with any purchase of um, any EHC medication. Now, if you haven't, if, it was, if you're a pre-reg student, for example, or um, you haven't had any experience or exposure with supplying EHC, then I really recommend that you sit in a consultation with an experienced pharmacist who has delivered EHC consultations before, of course, with the consent of the patient too, so that you can learn from them. I think with consultations, it's really, you can learn so much from actually watching somebody um, conduct that consultation and arguably, in my opinion, more so than reading it from books or, or information. I think actually being able to watch somebody live doing that consultation can actually be really beneficial and you can take aspects of what they do and you can learn from how they conduct those consultations and then develop your own style going forward. So that's something that I really do recommend. So first and foremost, when it comes to EHC consultations is you have to decide whether you from a moral, ethical or religious perspective, if you feel comfortable to supply EHC. And if you don't, that's absolutely OK. But you must still ensure that you signpost and support the patient. So, for example, is there another pharmacy pharmacist within your pharmacy who can deliver EHC consultations? Where's the next um, local pharmacy where you can signpost the patient onto so that they can get the EHC supply from there? Um, their GP, for example, they, you can refer them to the GP. Um, where's the nearest gum clinic? It's so important to know what services you have around you, what other pharmacies you have around you so that you can still provide that support to the patient. Next really important thing is to make sure that you do, if, if you are comfortable with um, conducting an EHC consultation, that you do so within a private area, in a so in the consultation room essentially. This isn't a type of conversation that should be had over the counter, even if it's the only patient in a pharmacy. Again, give that patient that time they need, give them that respect as well. And it goes back to it being a very sensitive topic. So do make sure those conversations are having in the consultation room. The next thing to establish is the age of the patient. So, and, and whether or not that will tie in actually, um, so the age of the patient and also if there is a PGD, a patient group direction in place. Now, if there is a PGD in place, the pharmacist must supply the EHC in line with the requirements of that PGD and they must then use the Fraser guidelines um, to take into consideration every time a patient under 16 requests for a supply of um, the morning after pill or for EHC. Um, uh, we're, throughout this video though, we're gonna assume that there isn't a PGD in place and bear in mind that um, with no PGD in place, that levonorgestrel, they can actually only be supplied to over 16 year olds. So if anybody under 16 um, comes into the pharmacy, again, make sure that you can refer them to those relevant um, services um, in the area, as well as to their GP. So the next thing to establish is, what is the reason for emergency hormonal contraceptive? Was it unprotected sexual intercourse? Was it condom failure? Um, did the patient miss a pill? Miss a contraceptive pill, for example? Now I have two videos, um, periods, pops and pills, and genitourinary system, where I mentioned in both of them about missed pills. So do refer to those videos um, with regards to missed pills and what you should do in the situation if a patient misses a pill. For the purposes of this video, we're purely gonna be covering emergency hormonal contraceptives. So really important to establish the reasoning for find emergency hormonal contraceptives. What's also important to establish is safeguarding aspects as well. Now, when it comes to EHC, you can only have a consultation directly with the patient. You can't have a conversation with the patient's partner, for example. They can't have the consultation on the patient's behalf. It has to be with the patient. 
whether or not you have somebody else in the room, so the patient's partner, for example, um, that's where you have to use professional judgment. Sometimes it's best if it's just you and the patient in the room, um, or if they want, for example, a chaperone, then you can ask one of your other pharmacy staff members to come and join you. But whether it's the patient's friend or their partner or anybody else with them, that's where you have to use your professional judgment if actually it is appropriate for somebody else to be in that room in that consultation or if it's just like I said you and the patient so safeguarding comes into this as well. So the next thing to consider is when did the sexual encounter take place because this will really take into account what options the patient will have. So if for example um, sexual intercourse happened within 72 hours then they can be offered levonorgestrel. If sexual encounter and the sexual encounter or sexual intercourse happened within 120 hours, then you can present them with uliprostyl acetate. There is a third emergency hormonal um, contraceptive that is available that I think a lot of people tend to forget about, and that is the copper IUD. And the copper IUD should still be presented as an option to a patient, even if it's not something which is in, which is sold in pharmacies or something which a pharmacy would instill into a patient. It's shown to be the most effective form of emergency contraception or contraception in general. Um, so it, it should still be presented as an option. You, studies have then shown that uliprostyl acetate is then the most effective and then levonorgestrel. Now, again, like with anything, really, you have to ensure that you give a non-biased and you're non-judgmental within any of these consultations. You can't say things, for example, to a patient that, oh, um, you can't say things like, well, drug X costs £30, whereas drug Y costs £15. So just go with drug Y because that's the cheaper one. You can't be saying things like that. You need to present all information in a non-biased, non-judgmental way. And then it's the patient who can then, if, if they do have more than one option, then it's the patient who can decide which option would be best for them and which option they'd like to go for. But do, do, do always do offer the copper IUD as an, an option as well, which they can either go to their GP or to a sexual health clinic um, and, and, if they do go for that option, then make sure that they do understand they should go that day to get the ball rolling on having the copper IUD instilled. So next we're going to talk about is menstrual history. So we want to find out when the date was of the patient's last period and if they had any abnormalities. Was it lighter? Was their period heavier than usual? Again, this will all contribute towards what options are available to them, but also do they need to be referred? Also need to consider do they take any other medication or do, what their medical history is? So do they currently take contraceptive, um, a combined oral contraceptive? Do they already take a progesterone only pill? This will go back to what I was saying earlier about missed pills. So not necessarily needing emergency hormonal contraceptive if they've had a missed pill. Do they take any medicines that are enzyme inducers such as anti-epileptics? If they do, this doesn't mean that we can't give them EHC. Um, we might actually need to give double the dose, for example, with levonorgestrel. So instead of giving 1.5 milligrams, they would take a three milligram dose. Or again, copper IUD, that is an option to them. You would never recommend uliprostyl acetate as a double dose, that's, that's just not a thing. Um, but so yeah, for this situation, it would be levonorgestrel at a double dose or copper IUD. Also establish, has the patient had EHC before? And if they have, then do they remember which one they took? And do they remember when was the last time they had it? Was it six months ago? Was it a year ago? Was it in the same cycle? Now, if it was in the same cycle, say a woman has already had uliprostyl acetate within their cycle, then they can be offered uliprostyl acetate again. If they've had uliprostyl acetate, in their cycle, then levonorgestrel should not be taken in the following five days. If a woman has taken levonorgestrel, then they can have levonorgestrel again. If a woman has taken levonorgestrel, then uliprostyl acetate, in theory, can be less effective if it's taken in the following seven days. So again, just to reflect, it's important to know whether or not the patient has had EHC before, which one they've had before and was it within the same cycle or not. The next thing to ask the patient is whether or not they are currently breastfeeding. If they are, then they can take levonorgestrel, but the advice is that they should take it straight after breastfeeding and then avoid nursing for at least eight hours following levonorgestrel administration. 
Eulipristal acetate, on the other hand, it is present in breast milk. So it's recommended to actually avoid breastfeeding for at least one week um, of administration. But during this time, it's still recommended that the woman expresses the milk, but then discards it so that it still stimulates lactation. It's also important to advise, um, like with any medicine, um, to give our patient the right counselling points. So for example, on side effects, particularly with regards to vomiting when it comes to EHC. So if a patient vomits within two hours of taking levonorgestrel, they should take another. If a patient th vomits within three hours of taking eulipristal acetate, they should take another. Also advise a patient about their next period. It may be earlier or maybe later than what they're used to. The patient, if they experience any lower abdominal pain, they must seek medical, immediate medical attention because this could signify an ectopic pregnancy. So do you make sure that you make your patient aware of that. It might also be worth having a conversation with your patient about any future contraceptions. So they might not be aware of what contraceptives there are available or what options there are available to them. And this is your opportunity to then educate that patient and make them aware. Um, help them in setting up that process of maybe then referring them to their GP to be prescribed a particular contraceptive, for example. Also give your patient, if applicable, um, educate them about STIs. For example, if they've had a one night stand and signpost to where chlamydia testing is offered. Again, it drills into what I was saying earlier about ensuring that you know what services are available in the local area. Now, a pregnancy test should be offered if the next menstrual period is delayed by more than seven days or if it is lighter than usual and if it's associated with that lower abdominal pain um, that I was mentioning earlier, which could signify ectopic and ectopic pregnancy. So it's not the normal lower abdominal pain, which a woman may experience with a period in general. It's something that, that feels a, a, lot, a lot more severe. Also, additional training as well is required. So especially if you've not conducted any EHC training in the past, um, CPPE, for example, will have an abundance of resources and e-learning. So do make sure that you have a look at that. Also have a look at the Faculty of Sexual and Reproductive Healthcare Guidelines. It's a fantastic resource and it's um, a resource that I'll put the link to in the description box below. Um, particularly on pages nine and 10, they have algorithms on there and different flow charts. So if a patient, for example, has had sexual intercourse in the last 120 hours, then if they answer yes to that, this is what you advise. If they say no to that, then this is what you should do. I really recommend that you print those pages, have them in your consultation rooms, and at least when you're having those consultations with your patient, then it's a nice way to make sure that that conversation is flowing, but also that you do find out and ask them all the relevant bits of information. So definitely use those guides when you are having your consultations with patients. So as I mentioned earlier, this is a very sensitive topic for many, and make sure you do give that consultation the time and the respect that it requires. You might have female patients coming in who are very shy to ask for the morning after pill. So make sure to not be judgmental and make sure to be empathetic, sensitive to their needs and give them that time that they do require. So I hope you liked this video and if you did, why not give it a thumbs up, share, like, subscribe, do also check out my Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. And until next time, thank you for your time and happy watchings.